Hi listeners today I'm going to narrate a true story a case handled and to some extent solved by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The heading of the case was Sherlock Holmes real case It was a murder case worthy of the cold calculating detective powers of Sherlock Holmes An elderly widow had been battered to death by a brutal murderer who had rifled through her files of personal papers and who had inexplicably stolen just one cheap brooch from her valuable collection of diamonds and other gems A tall dark-haired man of about 30 had been seen by witnesses walking calmly away from the murder house in Glasgow It had not taken long for Scottish policemen acting under the pressure of public outrage to arrest a suspect who was tried for the murder and sentenced to hang 24 hours before the convicted man James Dealer Oscar Slater was due to meet the executioner his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment Although his life was spared he still faced a grim existence of hard labor in prison until his dying day Yet there were some lingering doubts about the case fears that Oscar Slater was no more than an innocent scapegoat But who could prove his innocence Who could sift through the evidence with enough authority and thoroughness to overturn the verdict of a powerful court backed by the full might of the Scottish legal system Sherlock Holmes that's who in the form of the creator of the fictional detective author Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Conan Doyle was disturbed by the case of Oscar Slater when he read of the murder investigation and conviction in the scholarly legal work Notable Scottish Trials the book outlined how on little more than suspicion and circumstantial evidence Slater had been found guilty of murdering 82 year old Miss Marion Gilchrist at a home in Queen's Terrace West Princess Street Glasgow on 21st December 1900 Miss Gilchrist had lived the life of a virtual recluse in her home attended only by a young maid servant 21 year old Helen Lamby and seeing only rare visitors mainly relatives the spinster's only pleasure in life seemed to come from the loving care of her collection of diamonds valued at 3000 pounds on the night her mistress died Helen Lambie had followed her usual practice of leaving the house around 19 hours to buy the evening newspaper. Miss Gilchrist remained inside, secure behind the double locked doors of her home. The outer door leading to the street was held only by a latch which could be opened by a cord from inside the apartment. If Miss Gilchrist recognized a visitor at the street door A few minutes after Helen left downstairs neighbor Arthur Adams heard the noise of a heavy fall from the apartment above and went to investigate The outer door was open but the double locked apartment door was still secure As he stood there puzzled Helen returned with the evening paper and the couple unlocked the door and went in Just as they entered the apartment a tall well-dressed man walked calmly past them and into the street Inside Marion Gilchrist was dead in the living room her skull crushed While Adams went to raise the alarm Helen Lamby ran the short distance to the home of Marion Gilchrist's niece Mrs Margaret Birrell and told her she had recognized the man who had walked from the apartment but the niece in a burst of outrage 
told Helen Namby she must be mistaken and she must not smear the man's reputation in any statement to the police. The police took only five days to produce some results to still the public outcry which followed the murder. They learned that gems dealer Oscar Slater, who lived not far from the murdered woman, had pawned a brooch of about the same value as the missing one. They also discovered that he and his young French mistress had fled from Scotland aboard the liner Lusitania using assumed names. Police persuaded the couple to New York where Slater was arrested and protesting his innocence agreed to waive extradition formalities and return to Glasgow. At his trial, the witnesses, with some hesitation, identified him as the mystery man. Slater, a German Jew, claimed, I know nothing about this affair, absolutely nothing. But the jury found him guilty by a majority verdict. Slater suffered three weeks in the condemned cell before his reprieve. The few doubts about Slater's innocence were carefully noted in the book which Conan Doyle read and it was enough to arouse his interest. He began to examine the case with the same fresh, uncluttered mind that he had devoted to his fictional super sleuth, Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street. Three years after the trial, after careful study of the transcripts of the court proceedings and correspondence with witnesses, Conan Doyle caused an uproar with his book, The Case of Oscar Slater. In the same calm style as Holmes, he punched gaping holes in the prosecution case. The brooch which had first drawn suspicion on Slater had been pawned three weeks before the murder. Slater, Conan Doyle pointed out, had fled with his mistress under assumed names because he wanted to give the slip to his domineering, grasping wife. Slater's own lifestyle as a gambler and womanizer had probably prejudiced the puritanical Scottish jury against him. Conan Doyle demolished the conflicting evidence of witnesses some of whom claimed that the mystery murderer had been clean-shaven, others who said he was bearded. And drawing on his own forensic expertise, he pointed out that when Slater's entire wardrobe of clothes was seized in his luggage aboard the Lusitania, not a single trace of blood was found on any of them. The Sherlock Holmes investigation produced immediate demands for a retrial or public inquiry. But the wheels of justice grind slowly. It took 18 years before Oscar Slater was released by the newly appointed Scottish Court of Criminal Appeal on the technicality that the judge at his trial had misdirected the jury. Slater was awarded £6,000 in compensation. But Arthur Conan Doyle never published the final chapter of his important murder investigation. Sherlock Holmes had proved Slater's innocence, but had he ever uncovered the real identity of the killer of Marion Gilchrist? Shortly before he died in 1930, Conan Doyle revealed to a friend I knew I had a difficult enough job in getting Oscar Slater freed. That was the most important objective I had to achieve. If I had tried at the same time to lay the blame for the murder on the real guilty man, it might have prejudiced Slater's chances of release. But I believe I know the identity of the real murderer, a man who was protected by the police because he was a prominent citizen who desperately wanted something from the private papers of Marion Gilchrist. He had gone unpunished. But it is more important to me that an innocent man is free. I am satisfied. 
थैंक यू